Welcome to Echoes Down the Road, a podcast presented by the band West of House. My name is Tommy, and today in episode 11, we wrap up our review of our debut album, Crescendo of Silence, with a look at the last song on the album, Voyeuristic Symphony. Join Eric, Lance, Bobby, and me as we talk about how this dynamic and contemplative song with both a halftime and symphonic feel came about, and as we take a deep dive into the even deeper lyrics. So sit back and get comfortable, because all of that is going to start right now. Well, welcome back. Thank you for joining us for our penultimate episode for season one. My name is Eric. My name is Lance. This is Tommy. You can introduce yourself this time again. Woo! Oh, you're letting me do it this yeah, time. Yeah, you can this do it. Bobby. You're almost this part is... of the family. Wow. All right. <laughs> this is Bobby Phillips joining for the third, his third, my third episode. Words are hard. This is past my bedtime. Wow, that's okay. That, that means it's only going to get better. So oh, we got yeah. Bobby back in the house, which is wonderful. And today we will be breaking down the final song off of our debut album, Crescendo of Silence, Voyeuristic Symphony. It rolls off the lips. We made it, boys. We did it. It, It's a little emotional. It'd probably be more emotional if you weren't going to do any more of these, but we do have, like I said, by using that nice word penultimate, we have one more episode left in this season. I see Tommy grabbing the dictionary real fast. He didn't know what that meant. (laughs) And then... There will be a season two, Westies. You will be in for a treat. We're not going to talk about that this episode. Maybe we'll hit on it next week. But season two will be coming your way, which is exciting, huh, guys? Absolutely. Yes. Eric, it makes it sound like we know what we're going to do in season two, but we We always know what we're going to do. There's (laughs) everything's intentional and planned far in advance. We never wing it. Never. No, never. Yeah, no, not like right now. Well, one thing we're not going to wing. Oh. <laughs> There's that sound again. Eric, what you drinking this fine evening? Well, I'm glad you asked, Lance. Uh, since it's we're back recording at night, I'm going to drink something real. And I've got a Smog City IPA. It's from a brewery in Torrance. And just going back to my favorite, those West Coast IPAs sucking on the pine cone and goes down... Well, I don't want to say smooth, but gloriously. How about you? Well, let's see if I can trigger this bad boy. Mine was better. I'm yeah. I'm uh, sitting in my garage drinking the brewery's mischief. It's a hoppy Belgium style ale. We don't know if it's an IPA or an ale, but it is eight and a half percent. So. It'll tuck me in bed nicely tonight. Let's see if you get through the episode with that. Seriously. (laughs) Cheers, my friend, Bobby. Mr. Phillips has got something there, doesn't he? Yeah, I sure do. Hang on. This is going to be good if I can get the sound going. (laughs) That's nitro. I can tell just by the sound that is nitro. I thought it was laser beamers. (laughs) That is a uh, chai milk stout nitro from Left Hand Brewing down in Longmont, Colorado. Oh, that sounds good. And Tommy, is that Metamucil that I see? (laughs) Yeah. This is a Lipton Diet Citrus Tea. (laughs) Don't knock, man. Those are tasty. I'll give him that. You should have stayed with Metamucil. No, oh. I've got hours of work to do after we're done here, so I can't be all... Does that work include drums? Editing, yes. Oh, hey, that's good. Hopefully. Okay. That's good. I have five takes of the song I'm working on, and hopefully I have enough in there to comp one good one. That's so I'm a getting start, a mix man. soon then, right? So are... What's that? Would you be... I'm getting a mix soon, right? <laughs> oh, Bobby, yeah, we got uh, some stuff yeah. for you, Bobby. So, Tommy, would you be uh, making an allusion, perhaps, to new music? Yeah, because it's our music I'm recording, not for someone else. Because you wouldn't care about that. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I was, I was gonna, you know, protest, but it's Eric was searching for a hook. (laughs) If you had said it was for someone else, I would have said play our damn stuff instead, (laughs) and fire you, obviously. Yeah, yeah, you're fired, Tommy. I know. There it is. All right. There it is. So shall we dive in to the tune, my friends? 
Absolutely. Yes. Let's do it. With our speedos and everything. So if you have listened to the EP that we released, uh, the Pinecone EP, a wonderfully titled uh, album, courtesy of our <laughs> Mr. Tommy Maris. Who knows what it means? He does. Maybe someone else does. I don't, but... Doesn't mean anything. It could mean anything. Doesn't it's have to mean anything. very esoteric, pulling stuff That's from right. Moving Shadows. But along those lines, and on that EP, is a demo version of this song, Voyeuristic Symphony, which is actually the very first uh, recorded version of that. It was written the same day as the 2015 version of Moving Shadows. So, which is kind of fun that those were both written on the same day and recorded on the same day. So if you pull up uh, the Pinecone EP, you can give a listen to that demo. Uh, also, you can give a listen to the album version of Voyeuristic Symphony if you want to hear that before we kind of dive into it. So you can just push pause on the podcast and get that going when you're ready. That would be cool. But going back to the demo, it was kind of fun because I, I was in a... We talked about, I believe, in the Moving Shadows episode where I was in a place where I wasn't really writing much in 2015. And to have two songs just kind of jump out like that made it a very productive day. Yeah, that's impressive, especially because you said it might be one song every few years to have uh, twins, you could say. Born on the same day. That's uh, a, a two-song a two-song day, and probably <laughs> what well, was probably a two-song year as well. Right. You know, and then the West of House writing sessions began, and well, we still don't know what's happening there because oh, I don't know how many songs we've written in the past year and a half. I think I've got bits and pieces for fifty, sixty, Oof. and at least twenty-five full ones. So we're we're doing a little better now. Yeah, we have a lot to play with for many years. But let's, uh, how about we play a little bit of that demo? And you can kind of hear the, the birth, if you will, of Voyeuristic Symphony. So, here you go. Let's go to a party Where no one was invited Claim the guest list is awful you can laugh at all our stories and claim they're inside jokes like they did in days of old. And I will hardly even notice those outside are crying because it looks the same with no sound. Light a match, pull the string, take a shower It's all the same in this town Hallelujah Hallelujah, glory be Thank you, Jesus They're not like me So there you go. That's the acoustic version of Voyeuristic Symphony. And really not much has changed foundation-wise. Uh, there have been a few lyric changes, which if you guys are quick on the draw, you'll figure out. But the interesting thing about Voyeuristic is even though I wrote it on the acoustic and just played it on the acoustic, there was a much bigger song there in my head. And you'll hear on the album, what that song turned into. But if you're a mu musician out there, and I don't know how you write music, uh, and maybe Bobby can kind of commiserate too, because I know he crafts his own songs. Uh, when you start writing, it's, it's never really what you hear. And only after a while does it finally become that. And that's a real fun feeling when, when your creation kind of matures into fullness. I'll absolutely speak to that. Um, I don't want to do too much of my own self-promotion, but I wrote a song a few years ago called Change of Course that appeared on an acoustic EP that I did that was just acoustic guitar in my voice. And that was the one song of the five songs on that album that I heard 
in kind of, kind of a similar fashion to what you ended up doing with Voyeuristic Symphony um, is adding a whole bunch of other layers to it and having the song build and build and build. Um, structurally in that way, those songs are similar and I got a lot of, I was reminded a lot of when I was working on that song when I was working on Voyeuristic Symphony. I totally get that whole, you write the song on just an acoustic guitar and a vocal, but in your head, you're probably hearing, you know, other electric guitars or synthesizers, other voices, strings, other instruments. Um, yeah, I totally get that. And I'm sure a lot of other musicians do too. Let's kind of get the, uh, the rhythm section to chime in on that. I know I tell you guys, Hey, you know, here's this version, but I'm also hearing this and this and this and try to paint a picture. But then when you hear like, say an acoustic demo, are you able to go that extra step and kind of hear what's what's being explained? Uh, no, not at all. It's actually <laughs> uh, it's actually really frustrating for me uh, trying to figure out where you're going with just acoustic guitar because I don't know if the song's getting big here, if it's getting little here, because a lot of times acoustic guitar doesn't really have the same volume. You know, it doesn't flow and ebb like we normally would. I really bug Eric about lyrics every time. Like, Hey, cool. This is a cool song. Give me some lyrics because with the lyrics, I can really get an idea kind of where the song's going. I can get more of the emotion out of that than just strumming on a guitar. Yeah. I've heard you say that a lot, Tommy, more than any drummer I've played with before, which I think is cool because I think a drummer, especially with a, you know, a ride and a crash and your cymbals dynamics are huge. And you're right, with vocals, you can really kind of hone in on that. So I appreciate you saying that. I know sometimes you're not going to have that opportunity because Eric will probably throw down a guitar track here or there. Sometimes it has vocals because it all comes from the same place. But I don't know, for me, I, I think it depends. So I think sometimes, like Tommy, I, I'm not sure where you're going, but if the guitar lines have that dynamic i could definitely hear lines in my head and i can kind of knowing that it's going to be a rocker or not i i can probably project what i would like to do so i think for me it just depends on what it is you produce and how many lines or kind of the melody or between your verse the chorus and bridge i could kind of feel that out depending on what you're producing so I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, because this is my first time interacting with Tommy in the context of the podcast, I'm curious what that dynamic between Tommy and Eric looks like as far as discussing the dynamics and, and what the flow of the, uh, the song is going to go like from a drummer's perspective. Because I've, you know, I've jammed with drummers in the room, but I've never dealt with another drummer remotely like what you guys are doing. So I was wondering if you guys could speak to that, because um, I haven't heard much about that. Yeah, well, this song was a little easier than some of the others because it was more completed. So, uh, like back on um, Chasing After Memories, there was no lyrics, and I played it with no lyrics. And then when I heard the lyrics, I thought, I might have played this differently. It worked out great. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but as far as, as it goes, usually, like, I'll hear something, or actually, Eric will have, like, maybe, depending on the song, he might have a drum beat programmed in and he's heard that drum beat for six months before I've heard it. So I'm hearing the song for the first time and hearing things differently because I haven't heard anything yet to it. So sometimes I have to uh, either give in to Eric's drum beat and kind of play around what he did. Cause it actually might sound good. And then sometimes I'm like, Nope, I want to go this direction and hopefully he'll go with it. Awesome. No, I was just curious how that worked. It's hit or miss when I go with it, but I mean, we've sometimes magic happens. There's only a few songs. Like if we have something like Holy ghosted, which is obviously programmed, uh, where it's like, okay, we're, we're using these programmed drums or I can't recall if there was a demo where I really said, okay, this is the one. Uh, sometimes you're like, I like the feel of this. Yeah which usually means I can't change it too much because that will change the feel. Well, the fun part is when I program the drums, I'll make sure it sounds good on one part of the song, but I'll use the same damn drum beat for the whole song. <laughs> so I'm like, you know yes. what? This is really good for the verse. Ignore the other stuff. That happened on echoes down the road. There was, I stole some of your parts. I just played them in a different place. Like I'm like, yeah, this sounds good. Just not right here. I'm going to play it over here, but I really liked it. And uh, getting back to uh, Lance and we're talking about lyrics. This song, 
for sure. And I'll get into it when we talk more about the drums. I really accented the lyrics in the choruses. And if those lyrics hadn't been there, I would have played something completely different. And I don't know if it would have been, I don't want to say not as good, but it certainly would have been different. I, I could see that it's totally a vocal driven song. Yeah. The lyrics are, I mean, we will get into those They're They get pretty heavy and, and they existed for quite a long time. The, this song actually went through a couple of iterations where it attempted to become uh, what the vision was in my head. We played it in the Mad Ones uh, at a couple shows. And, and each time I think we played it, I, Lance was there. Uh, each time the song was different. It had either a different drummer or Kevin came up with a different guitar line. So the song was really ever changing. And then when we finally brought it uh, to West of House, you know, that became the version of Voyeur's, of Voyeuristic Symphony. Yeah, we, we played that, what, two or three times? About that. I, yeah. I, found a, I found a live clip today when I was uh, doing my studying for the show, and, and well, it wasn't great, so we're not going to play it. Because <laughs> no. it's, it's a hard song to translate live. Uh, I mean, like, like Bobby said, it's very uh, vocally and lyrically driven. It is a story. It's saying something. And I, I think really a song like this works better in an album format than a live format. I agree. Playing this live, unless you know the song intimately, you know, it, it definitely is not going to leave that impact unless you can. No, really it, it's not the words. barn burner. It's not the one that's going to make the dude stand up in the back and raise his ladder and go, yeah, voyeuristic. But if you knew oh, sure, the lyrics, it's a halftime ballad, we can do that. <laughs> if, if we had the symphony, maybe, which we'll we'll hit on later. Oh, that um, would be so dope. <laughs> but going back to the recording session, this was recorded early. This was the third song we recorded for Crescendo. And uh, for me, we, we did Fallen, which is good. That was like our introduction to Bobby, and we're kind of feeling our way. And then we did Yesterdays, where we started all the layering of everything. But then I think we hit our stride and got really comfortable with voyeuristic, which which I think you guys will kind of hear as we go in and talk more about it. And really, the I mean, the amount of tracks that we put in for it. And what's that count, Bobby? Okay, so I wrote it down. I pulled up the session earlier <laughs> today. Um, <laughs> I knew so, you would. What's that? I knew you would do that. That's <laughs> That's why I called on you. All right, so we've got 12 guitars uh, between Eric and Kevin. We've got uh, seven cello tracks, six violins, two violas, 10 vocal tracks to include your vocals and the guest vocals, uh, and 17 drum tracks, which is pretty, that's pretty low. restrained for Tommy. Pretty low. Yeah. Kind of low, yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. And Lance, <laughs> if you could just calm down next time. I've got one bass track. Yeah, represent. So, so we got 55 tracks total, and that's when Eric sends me tracks for vocals, he's usually got a wet and a dry version. So the dry version is just the recorded vocal. The wet version is the effects he was using on the vocal as he was working on it. So that's not counting the wet and dry versions. Um, if you count all those extra tracks, it was something like 76 or something like that. So 55 audio tracks, and then after I added all my effects and my routing, I ended up with 116 faders on that song. Oh, yeah. yes. That is so, good. I'd yep. say oh, that's wow. a record for us, but I know you something else we're currently working on at this moment uh, has put that to shame, hasn't it? We're over 200 faders on that song now. <laughs> You know, maybe we will talk about that on a on a different podcast. We're not going to dive into that because it's scary and it will make me cry and I'll curl up in a fetal <laughs> position. And while I will know then how Tommy feels day to day, it will not be good for the remainder of this episode. <laughs> Sounds like a season two, Tommy. Yeah, it's it's a season two. Uh, yeah, it's stay tuned, Westies. It's it's going to be worth it. So yeah, 55 tracks of layers. 55 unique tracks, which at the time, I mean, coming off Fallen, which was like, I don't know, not counting drums, eight. 30, nine. yeah, exactly. Uh, yesterday's, which was a little more, but this was, it was, it felt like we were doing our magnum opus, but at the beginning of our story, you know, <laughs> because we knew, uh, I knew right away, this was the album closer. So we had to put together something absolutely epic. 
And when we started, were you going to say something, Lance? I was, Eric. So you've said that on multiple episodes and on my back porch, drinking a few pints. But what was it so early that you knew this was going to be the last song? Because that's an interesting statement to know that far out. It's how it's put together. You know, it's the the word symphony, it's in the title, but that's also the song. I knew the song had to become a symphony. And when those floodgates opened for session musicians, like we've mentioned Fiverr before, when I realized that I could get a cellist and someone to do violin and viola and uh, backup singers, uh, the female backup singers who sing on this, when I realized we had the option of doing that, you know, and not breaking the bank, then I knew it was going to become something epic. Very cool. So I started uh, just, I, I had the acoustic demo, obviously. I re-recorded everything and I started with just playing it on electric, which is what you're hearing right now. So, and the electric guitar part is the same as the acoustic part. It's just this really nice, you know, picking. Uh, the song's in D minor. It's, it's a very, you know, the saddest of all the keys. The saddest of all keys. If, if Spinal Tap has taught us <laughs> anything, and they have. And nice. just a, a really sweet kind of D minor to G little T thing, just kind of with picking. And I'm not great at picking because I have just the worst carpal tunnel. And this song is close to six minutes. So I think it was probably done in a couple different takes since I don't think I can actually pick a guitar uh, for six minutes straight anymore without my hands completely seizing up. And then this next overlay you're hearing, uh, this comes from the beginning of the song which is a, a magical, a magical little piece of equipment, which I'm going to hold up on our Skype, and I'm going to guess Bobby can guess it right away. That would be your Ebo. And that I would be my Ebo. I if you are not so familiar bad. with the Ebo, and I know most guitarists are, but this is, well, it's a piece of witchcraft. It's, uh, I, I believe it's done through magnetics, and Bobby can probably correct me because he knows everything. But it, there's some magnetics in here, and it goes with the pickup on the guitar, and it vibrates the string uh, through, like, magnetic attraction. And you can hit a note, and it will sustain that note for infinity, which is something that if you just pick a note, you cannot do unless you have, like, a sustainer like they used to have on the old Fernandez guitars. But it's if you listen to any U2, Ebo is all over that stuff. Uh, the Edge probably made his living using an Ebo. And so when you hear that opening uh, guitar tone right at the start of Voyeur Six Symphony, that's just one note on that Ebo just kind of crescendoing up, so to speak, no pun intended, and creating that symphonic feel from step one. And so I layered the, the rhythm guitars, I layered the Ebo stuff, and then I had the solo. And the solo is, we've talked about it in many, many, many episodes. So the song needed a melodic solo. If it needed some shred, we know we go to Kevin. But I did a melodic one. And let's, let's go ahead and play that solo right now. So you can hear a lot of melody. It goes over this whole picking pattern. It's like a, a F to G, and then it hits, I don't know, I think there's a B flat in there or something. It's a fun little section. And so, again, my, my background is in like Pink Floyd and stuff like that, and David Gilmour and U2. So, so that solo kind of encompassed all that in a very melodic thing. So I had all those guitar tracks, and really uh, with some program drums, I, I had the makings of a pretty decent demo, and then I sent it to Lance. Yeah, like you mentioned, this was our third song, and I don't remember how much time elapsed from when we finished yesterday's. And I also, Eric, do you recall if this third song was started? I know the idea of it was before, but it, did we start recording these parts prior to 
COVID lockdown? I, I asked because at some point you texted me, hey, should we bring in, and you brought up two songs, um, Shadows, as well as Four Years Symphony that we have done before with our Mad Ones little summer jams at the fair. But it was like, yeah, let's, I think we could make those, you know, into West of House type tunes. And for me, it was pretty simple because it's like riding a bike on both of those songs. I probably recorded both of them within a week or so. And, but did you find out if that was? Yeah, free? the, I put down the original demo on March 28th. So that would be like one week after the lockdown started. Yeah, that was my guess. I, I didn't I didn't have those date stamps like you do, but when I was thinking about tonight's recording, I think that's why that must have triggered. I mean, you obviously brought it up prior to it, but it was an easy thing to, to kind of transition to it because you, myself, and Kevin were familiar with them. And if we could make them window west of house type tunes, it would be a pretty quick production for us as we moved along in all of your other magical glory. But yeah, so it was easy. I think I recorded it in an hour or so, and and I know it so well. And but I, you know, thinking about this podcast, and I, I kind of looped the song and listened to it a lot today. For me, you know, I I enter in late. I think I entered at the end of the first chorus, which is not the way we do it when we played with our previous ensemble. But the song just had a bigger feel, and I don't know if you and I talked about it, but. It just didn't feel right to come in. And honestly, looking at it back now today on the final product, following Tommy's epic drum break, the end of that first chorus, it's such a cool place to start because it's like we kind of talked about it and then the voyage really starts with that perfect break. I love it, Tommy. It's probably one of my favorites on the whole album. And I end up just settling on like a nice smooth sliding line between our D minor, as you mentioned, and and G. And it was very tasteful and clean. And I just wanted to have a real supportive and pleasant sound down low. And I, I love listening to it. But the funny thing about that is I might talk about that later. But I have to bring up the fact that cello is involved. And you, you bring this up. I, I didn't realize when Bobby said there were seven cello lines. I don't know if it's... If that's because there were so many broken pieces, or it was literally seven different faders that you kept, but uh, the cello guy, whatever his name is, and he is amazing, Stephen he, Schumann. Stephen Mr. Schumann. Schumann. He literally overlaid my exact line in the verses. Like I, 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 for a while, I couldn't even hear myself. I'm like, what did did I get replaced by a cello? Which you know, yes. I was call yes, you, you Jason. Yeah. Yeah. No, you got, that was the it's going to come fired. out now. We actually, there's, it's, it's our injustice for all. There's no base on you this. Got song. Adjusted for all. Yeah, I mean, I even do like little slides before I do my main slides back and forth between the two notes, and it, the guy freaking copied and plagiarized everything I was doing. <laughs> which initially I was like, wait a minute, who is this guy? Um, and and I, I knew that cello plays bass clef it actually can play treble and bass it's kind of an interesting instrument but typically it's in the bass range and and so you know be it what it is um i honestly couldn't hear myself unless i had better headphones and it wasn't until the very final note where i do like an octave walk i can like oh there there i am i'm there at the end at least that was nice of bobby to to kind of patch me in there to close the song Okay, so here, here's the thing. If if you're listening to the song, all the low end you hear, that is you. Oh, I know that. Okay, it was because, because the cello, I, I shelved off a lot of the low end to make room for you, Lance. It's the <laughs> overtones, man. You're the overtones. So the the as as and we'll get to the the strings eventually but the the seven cello tracks one of them is labeled bass cello i'm looking at it right now and it spans the whole song uh and then the rest of them cello one two and three i think come in after the first chorus and they're playing kind of little accent stuff and then i've got out outro cello one two and three which hit on that sort of orchestral thing at the very end of the song but all the low end in the song that's you the cello is really all you're hearing from the cellos 
is kind of the high string bow sound. Well, Chilo, and Tommy, Lance. Chilo, Lolo. <laughs> and, and Bobby, I appreciate you sticking up for all that. But honestly, it might sound petty from me that I'm unhappy <laughs> about it, but absolutely not at all. I am totally cool with it because the cello is easily my favorite sounding instrument. It's such, it's just butter. I, I can't explain it, but... No, it's so it, good. It just stops in my tracks, and it is the greatest sound ever. And so I would rather actually listen to an amazing cellist like Schumer than myself eight days Schumann. a week. So Schumer, Schumann, you know. You know, or you could just use this, you know, to encourage you to go actually buy some real headphones instead of your $10 iPhone AirPods that you listen to our yeah. songs on. Your Hello Kitty earbuds are not going to cut it for a rock star. All of my uh, gaming headphones that my kids have, yeah. So we'll be starting a GoFundMe, Westies, to buy Lance some real (laughs) headphones so he can actually hear low end. Lance, this is as good a time as any to tell you, the next West of House album is all going to be Moog bass. You're not playing on any of it. Right on, brother. (laughs) We're just going to get all synthesizer bass. That and 808. So, I mean, really, it's just another solo album. I'm sorry, guys. (laughs) Dilly dilly. If I'm not careful, it's going to be recorded drums, too, or programmed drums, too, Lance. So, you and I can just sit on the sideline. Yeah. Totally fine. Some signs to wave. As long as I can drink beer and hang out, I'm cool with that. Two out of three, right, Lance? Two out of three, man. That's, That's progress for me. So let's see. We got bass. We got me. What do you think? Do we give this song to Tommy? It's dangerous. Now let's try it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, you did. You gave me the song. And um, I remember thinking that, uh, so it's kind of slow and and it's kind of a halftime feel. And when a song is slow, there's a lot of space. And when there's a lot of space, you can either put a lot of crap in and screw it up or leave a lot of space and screw it up because it's in between the notes where you screw things up, right? It's not when you hit. So I tell people that when I play really difficult progressive songs, I'm usually better on tempo than I am with a slow ballad because there's less, less time to screw up. But um, this is a really cool song. So if you listen to the very beginning, you hear me stomp down on my hi-hat. So what I do when I'm recording, I, my, my computer's behind me, so I stand up, I get it all set up. I hit record, I turn around, I sit down, and I stomp on my hi-hat every song. And that made the cut. Eric thought that was pretty cool, and it kind of sounded like the symphony warming up. And I, I thought that was really cool. So that, that, that was all Eric. On the first mix, I had cut that out. And it was, you it did. was Eric who said, no, 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 put that back in. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so that's that's really cool. You're um, welcome, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So the the things I don't expect to get in make it, and then all my really cool fills get cut out. <laughs> but that's all right. No, no respect. No, this song has some, this song has some cool stuff. So I really like the fact that um, I was able to do a sixteenth note pattern on the hi hat, and then especially in the in that second verse, where it's just kind of a it's kind of a slow. Uh, halftime fit feel and then you know there's little color shots in there whether it's it's uh it's snare drum and an open eye hat on the uh a four or the little uh tom fill that's on the toms on the left so in the headphones they sound like they're coming off the left side it was just it was just fun to come up with that but i i recall when i was recording it i like to have everything consistent and, and I was really struggling with getting a consistent way to play it as far as, okay, I'm going to play this section three times and we're going to have a little fill in this section without overplaying it. And so I, I experimented a lot with that. Um, but I really like what happened. And like Lance said, there are some really cool fills in this and uh, coming into that, out of that first chorus and then going into the break, the instrumental bridge, there's a big... Uh, like 30 second note thing a la you know neil pure you hear that lance pure Peer- yeah or is he f- you know important or something is like he that. from perth australia though no he's from canada <laughs> eh? shut up lance <laughs> uh, um nice doesn't quite have the same ring but i do like the moxie i know yeah that, that was not gonna make the hat <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> that. Uh, but no, it was a really cool song. And then um, if you listen to it, the uh, last chorus, I'm on the ride cymbal, and then I'm accenting, accenting the see it differently, the, the syllable C, and then diff, and then Lee. And then that we do the chorus again, and that whole thing is done on the hi hat. And then I'm accenting the same thing again, but instead of China on the right, it's a custom stack on the left. But that's just if those lyrics wouldn't have been there, I wouldn't have been inspired to do that because I wouldn't have heard them. Uh, but I really, I just this was a really cool song, and I'm really happy with with how it came out. Um, the song was written in such a way that I was able to really explore some ideas that fit. And then even when I'm not really playing anything difficult, it just, the feel is so good, you know, with the bass and the, and all the strings and, uh, yeah, it was really cool. And this song actually has a happy mistake. It has a Bob Ross moment and I'm going to play it right here for you. Here's the Bob Ross moment. Yeah. That crash symbol right there. Uh, it's because, um, when I was first listening to the song, there's a progression there in that instrumental that repeats three times. And then the fourth time it doesn't repeat, but I thought it did. And it wasn't until after I recorded and after I sent my stuff to Bob, he's like, Oh, that, that crash will probably shouldn't be there, but it works. So I left it in and I didn't, uh, didn't, you know, make a fuss about well, it. I, but, I think um, everyone would agree uh, with me that you've now ruined the song, Tommy. It's I, I can't even <laughs> listen to it now. It's anathema to my <laughs> very soul. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to listen to that later. Then just that big fill uh, building up to the last chorus. There's just lots of tension building up um, with the strings and the rhythm of everything. And just the, I'm accenting all that, trying to build up a ton of tension. Then there's a big fill coming down with the crash cymbals on the hits and the, the uh, triplet toms in the middle. And then just... Blah, chorus at the end that just kills it. So, now this was a cool song. I I really enjoy listening to this song, and it just really is a journey. You know, a musical journey, which is what a symphony. As someone who plays in symphonies and I, I do that kind of drumming as well this is really cool and actually when i when i heard it i i told eric this would be super cool if we could actually get a symphonic version of this uh done someday so talk about a gofundme <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll, that, we'll hit on well, <laughs> we'll hit on that a little later in the episode uh, not the GoFundMe. Talking about the symphonic version. No. <laughs> Don't send us your money. Just subscribe. That's yeah. enough for us. There you go. Well, they could buy the album. Don't discourage that. Oh yeah, it's true. The shirt, the hat, those are coming. Maybe they'll say, "Shut up, <laughs> Tommy." Merch. We're gonna have know. merch. They might. We'll be the only. We'll be the only online band with merch. Like a band that's never been together, but uh, I'm, buy our merch. I'm sure we're not forging that path before anyone else. If you could buy Kardashian merch, then you could buy West of House merch. We actually contribute something there, to the world. Is there a Kardashian <laughs> band? I don't know about it. I don't know, but she wears Slayer. If there is. Does, one of them wears a Slayer shirt, and that's just, come on. Yikes. I know you don't listen to Slayer. You're not walking around your house singing South of Heaven. <laughs> All right, Ready so skipping from, <laughs> skipping from Satan to other things. Uh, so Kevin came on next. Kevin's not with us today. Uh, if he were, you would have heard maybe three or four words by now. But Kevin threw down some guitars, and if I'm looking at this correctly, it looks like he had six guitar parts that he put on uh, just doing his color thing. And it was another song where when Tommy and Lance and I were done with the song, uh, really, I didn't know what else to put in there because it could have been done then. And then Kevin adds his stuff, and he does some really cool stuff. Some of those, you know, some of those overlays you're hearing right now. Uh, just again, his mastery of melody. Uh, when he gets to the solo, uh, it's interesting. He doubled my solo, which at first I was like, why? But then it, it, it fattened it up, which was great. But then I was kind of touched that he just learned my solo and doubled it, you know, to, I don't know, to say, hey, I'm with you, bro. 
That's what Kevin would say if he were here right now. That's true. He likes to go to bed at 8 o'clock, so he's unable to say that. But uh, but he would. He, I, I can hear him saying that. Absolutely. He's an endearing young man. So he does, you know, he adds the color. He added some, like, rhythmic riffing under the verses, which sounded really good, and just did a great job on it. So I wanted to highlight it just because I thought it sounded awesome. The solo that Kevin plays right after the first chorus, um, before we go back into the next verse, is the most comfortably numb Pink Floyd solo I've heard him play of, of all the songs I've worked with you guys on. And that just spoke to my soul. It was amazing. I just love that sort of slow, melodic playing. Um, and it really contributed to the whole vibe of that song. Kev, he bleeds emotion. Uh, I mean, it, it's cool because he can shred and you're like, ah, oh, he's got look at a little Ingve in his soul. Mm. But then if he goes blues, like, I mean, God, how many times have we mentioned the damn Fallen solo? 60 right? or 70. <laughs> w- when he does that, you're like, wait, you're not faking this. This is coming from your from your inner gooeyness. And it's wonderful. Yeah, Very eclectic. Awesome. So we got the song. We got me. We got Lance. We got Tommy. We got Kev. We got a full band thing here. And this is when we get sassy. This is when I, I brought in the session musicians. And we talked about Fiverr before. It's a wonderful place to go for, for inexpensive uh, but yet talented musicians. Now, fair warning, Westies out there, if you use Fiverr, it can be a crapshoot. Because you could get someone that their samples sound good and you'll get something back that's not. And this has happened. We've been burned. In fact, even on this song, which we'll get to in a bit. But before, this is where we started with Stephen Schumann, uh, the cellist, who stole all of Lance's parts and he cried earlier in the episode. The Uh, Schumann. This guy, I believe he's on the East Coast. And I remember I was talking with him and he's like, well, do you have anything written out? Or you, do you just want me to play hot licks? Now, the very fact that he used the term hot licks got serious? him the job immediately. Uh, no joke, Lance. Wow. He used the term hot licks. So I'm like, you're already hired. So- <laughs> you could suck, but but just the nomenclature that you're throwing at me right now, I am here for it. And so I didn't write anything for the cellist. I said, you know what, man? You're, you're the expert. Do your thing. And the thing that so he sends, it takes like seven, eight days. He sent his tracks back and I, I forgot who I was texting, uh, probably Lance, where I'm like, dude, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. Because we had never had actual cello in a song before. I'm sure we tried like some synth cello, which is just, don't do that. It's stupid. Nope. If it's fake cello, it's not real cello. Let's never talk about that unless I'm doing my Biggie song, which you might hear on the next album. Ooh, did I say that out loud? I don't know. Biggie Smalls? We have a song inspired by Biggie Smalls. And if you're one of the, you know, 60, 70, 100 listeners out there, you're going to be intrigued. And that's all I'm going to say. Because no one else in this podcast knows what the hell I'm talking about right now. Bobby's face. If you could see Bobby's (laughs) face, Westies, it, it is just a mixture of surprise and what is that? Confusion and arousal. It's which is my default state with you guys. Oh, I thought it was horror. <laughs> the default state with you guys. It's it's a good song. The, the working title is Early Morning Showdown, and it's a damn good one. But we're not going to get into the second album right now. So so we get Schumann, and he does this beginning part. Now, Tommy had kind of mentioned, you know, there's the part where he sits down. You know, he, he plops his ass into the into the throne. You hear that. You hear him hit his hi-hat. Well, if you listen carefully at the start, you actually hear Schumann in his chair and he, the chair creaks a little and then he gets his cello and then he starts with that opening line. And I left it all in on purpose because I wanted it to be when you hear the orchestra tune up. That's why there's a little extra time between the end of Echoes Down the Road and the start of Voyeuristic Symphony. Because Echoes Down the Road is a strong song and we talked about it in the last episode. That could end an album. I mean, it, it's a burner. It's it's a bop, as the kids say. You know, you hit that, you're you good. That at the beginning of the song for voyeuristic. Yeah, his little yeah, that's like, warm up. Yeah, it's it's yeah. you know I don't know if you if you're you know have you are heard you the song Lance? Lance? Have you ever seen a symphony? Uh, yes, <laughs> mostly in seventh grade, but yes. 
So when uh, you know you go there and all the people they shift in their seats and they grab their stringed instruments and the dude with the oboes, you know, making fun of people because you know the oboist is a jerk. That's just you know he is, and and they do you know they that tune double reed guy. they tune to the uh, the the A above middle C as we reference and turn a phrase, yep, and yep. that's how you know it's starting. And that's why I mean Tommy's thing where he just hits the hi hat. It's perfect for the beginning of a song. So Dillbag, I meant the beginning of our song, not the beginning of an orchestra playing their <laughs> songs. You're saying when he creaks the sh- his chair and he's kind of doing his thing, that's when you kind of opened up the song, right? Not later, right. got right before the solo. Just yeah, just well, clarifying. No, thanks every, for the orchestra. Everyone listening there. thinks you're stupid, Lance. Everyone is on my side. Good Send try. an email to us right now. Westofhouseband at gmail.com. <laughs> Tell us whose side you're on, Westies. And if it says Lance, well, then we know you guys are wrong. Wow. So, <laughs> so every I've got an ear infection right now, Westies. My equilibrium's messed up. I don't know what the hell I'm saying, but it's going to be a great episode. <laughs> so we start the song off, and he does that long uh, string line with the cello, and we've got the Ebo crescendoing, and Tommy's doing whatever Tommy's doing. You can just hear him seething and sweating in his seat, and it's wonderful. <laughs> And it just, it brings into life this song that is voyeuristic symphony. And then he he does his thing throughout the song. And then we get to the ending. And this, I think it may be some of my favorite cello that he does uh, on the album, even over what he did on Chasing After Memories. He does this little improvised thing. How many tracks are there, Bobby? Three, four? Oh, my the gosh. End? Uh, seven total cello tracks. Um, so but the, the very impro- end. The, um, the improvisational stuff is... It's either three or six tracks. I can't remember where the outro cello tracks start. I think it's three. So it's, it's at, at the very least end of the three. Song. Yeah. Yeah. He does this thing and it's, I don't know, like this lilting melody after the song is over, but it was so perfect. We, we had to keep it in there. It just turned out uh, to be absolutely beautiful. It is. It's, again, the prettiest sound I, I know in music. I know before you even reached out i think pretty early on you were envisioning cello i don't even know absolutely i mean i think the viola and violin maybe just came in after but cello was a very early excitement and vision that you had if i remember right well cello was number one i mean i'm like you of out of all the stringed instruments and they're all great if you play something else you know that's wonderful but cello it's my favorite too there's just something about the darkness of it and the beauty. It's, it's like uh, if melancholy were an instrument, it would be cello. I do have one other string instrument that I've always dreamed of. So, Eric, yes, cello is by far the, my favorite instrument, but there is one that I dream of often. And someday in my life, I dream of being woken in my bedroom from a beautiful blonde woman at a harp, and I'm talking the full-size harp, playing and waking me up with all those strings and all those red octave strings. Oh, my gosh, is it just Nirvana? Well, what if it were just Tommy in a wig? That might suffice (laughs) because the look of my wife when I've told her this was pretty appalling, so I might have to resort to Tommy in a wig. (laughs) I, You know, I have to agree with Lance. The last time I played... In a symphonic situation, there was a harpist, and was she blonde? She had was she a, beautiful. She, I don't remember. I was listening to the music because I'm not a. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you got straight called out, Lance. I am guilty as charged. My nickname of my initials is Little Dirtbag, so guilty as charged. <laughs> no, but I just thought it was so beautiful, and I was just like, okay, if I ever hit the lottery and I have money to burn. I'm going to hire a harpist just to play in my house for eight hours a day. Cause I work from home. And if I just had a harpist somewhere, she wouldn't have to be anywhere. I could see her. It could be anywhere. And I would, that I would just be something I would want. Why is it going to be she? Why couldn't it be a dude playing the harp? I've never seen a man play. Well, a harp. I think there True. needs to be someone out there. Cause that's pretty sexist. Minus the harmonica. A lot of dudes playing that could harp. Be. But no, it's not going to matter because, you know, the amount of money we have, we're not going to have a harpist. You'll be no. lucky if you get a guy with a mullet playing a guitar. That's that's more your financial status. 
So you just gotta you just gotta do it the right way, which is what I did, is that I married a very attractive, very blonde part time harpist. I well, win. I need to. F- can I fly her into my bedroom, Bobby? Uh, <laughs> you know the fact that you ask so nicely has me thinking maybe. Yeah, well, and I'm not like Bobby or Tommy. I'm not going to ask her to play eight hours. I just want about five minutes to wake me up. And Tommy's also got once this. A week. Tommy's also got this seen not heard thing. Like I don't want him walking by and be like you are to be se- heard, not seen. <laughs> like wouldn't back you just to your think dungeon. you were dead though at that point? If someone's playing harp, you know, when I wake up, I'm wondering if I'm waking up in the afterlife. <laughs> and you know, to be honest, I'm not going to be expecting harp. It's going to be like metal where I'm probably going. Uh, right, well, plug, be Randy plug, Rhodes plug. and those guys, right? It'll be Lemmy. Lemmy will be playing at Lemmy. maximum volume. Satriani, he's waiting for you. He's not dead. Satriani. <laughs> I thought he died. No. Is that a surfing with the alien tattoo? It totally is. Yeah. Oh, that's badass. Hey, so side note on this, uh, when my daughter was playing volleyball, I made uh, videos of her playing for college recruiters, and surfing with the alien was the music I put underneath nice. it. It was perfect. Yeah, big fan. So if you, go, if you go search her on YouTube, you can find all her volleyball Maybe you should have called it surfing highlights. with the alien. Serving with the alien, that's right. Wow. Or setting with the happened. alien, because she Please was a Please edit out the dead jokes, Lance. Okay. <laughs> we are way off the rails. Where we, now. where are we on? Violins? Well, all of okay. this came from a cello. And yeah. And we're back to the right. string instruments that are real, we not go. the harp in my bedroom. So after cello, <laughs> uh, why not violins? And I found another very talented lady on Fiverr, and she played violins and viola. So we kind of had like our own string quartet with one person. And my favorite part of the entire song that I think the violins and viola add to the most are the thing we've talked about before, that break coming out of the bridge under the guitar solo, moving into the last chorus. The strings, the violins and the viola are playing, I don't know, I I think they're playing a little triplet section. And it's just building, 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 building. And then boom, you know, they crescendo into this huge final chorus, which is just so badass. It's the culmination of the entire song. I think listening to uh, what she had done with the recording here, this is when I absolutely fell in love with the song. Because you've got the cello, you've got a rock and guitar solo, you've got the violins, you've got the viola, and they just all bring it to this final chorus. And that that was the dream right there. You know, when you hear that, when you're like, you know, the these idiots from Orange County, California, and, you know, the guy with the buffalo in Utah, you know, the fact that we created this uh, is, we couldn't believe it at this point. Because we're, you know, we come from a world of crappy demos and cheapening out for everything we do. And then to, to have something like this, it was a pretty awesome feeling. It was a big sound we created, which was very cool. And sl- slightly intimidating to me. <laughs> Why is that, Bobby? Because uh, there was, what did I have? 70, 96, 142 tracks. I forget how high we got, but... One one sixteen, I think. It was, it was a lot. Yeah, it was one sixteen. It was a lot right. to wrangle. And this was, this was our third song with you. So I think I think Eric and I were like, "Do you think this is going to be okay? Is he going to like 
Tell us no, you guys are on your yeah, own. Yeah, we felt so bad. I think we, we, t- have like I think we tipped tracks. him extra after this one just so we could keep him around. I, yeah, I think we, we did. did. It's like, sorry You're about that. Here's sorry. another pile of money. You found the slightly masochistic <laughs> mix engineer who's like, no, more. Give me more. <laughs> Careful what you wish for, Bobby. Yep. <laughs> it's cold outside. I can't do anything else anyway. Come on, give me more music. <laughs> so we got the strings, and then I did something that I've always wanted to do which was, you know, not just listen to my stupid vocals, but also to bring in some female vocalists. And we did that off Fiverr again as well. I'm giving them way too much free advertising. And found three different uh, young ladies, one in Australia and two in the UK. And for them, I gave a little more direction as to what to do. Uh, uh, One of them actually went off and did some crazy things on her own, which are in the song which I think Lance is going to talk about in a second, but they did a great job too. They did. I, I mean, the fact, again, the Fiverr to make us international is always a cool feeling. So for this song, Fiverr really did bless us for the most part. Uh, Do you want me to speak about that favorite? Yeah, go for it. Have at it. Yeah. So again, I like the ladies. We already mentioned that. And I love the sound. And sometimes, <laughs> even earlier, I think we had a review that Eric's voice was so beautiful. <laughs> it was mistaken to be a woman's like, voice. You didn't need to bring in that, a vocal. That, that a was yesterday. Yeah, you already yeah, the reviewer are one. that said, I love the female vocals on yesterday's. Which is really a compliment. So you know, <laughs> I took take it as that. such. I yeah. was not offended in any way. Yeah. Most men don't have it's that. Like, I'm range. not offended. <laughs> So, but honestly, I think my favorite part of this song, which is silly, but it's when I start singing or at least lip syncing is, and I don't know what, uh, let me be careful with my language, female vocalist, I was going to use other words, um, the one that said, they are not like me, it's the first time they say that because then it repeats and it that lower lower on the register. But do you know if that was a UK lady? Or uh, that was Aust- Avery Co. Is her name? She's from Australia. She's uh, of very very talented. And yeah, she echoes uh, the "They are not like me" after I do in the chorus, and it's uh, one of my favorite parts in the song too. Gosh, she goes so high. I absolutely love it. I wish she did it more because I think it's only one time that she just you know, allowed it. Which yeah. kind of maddens me a little bit because it was like a unicorn. It mysteriously arrives out of, you know, the ether. And then before you know it, it vanishes and it's no. gone. I think once is perfect. It's just enough for you to hear it. And now I got to hear that song again. Tommy nailed it. Because I want to hear that part Tommy again. Yeah, see, that's why it's so, your favorite part because it only really happens cool. once. If it's there every yeah. time, you'd be like, hey. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, but I would like and, to and ride that, that, that unicorn part. a little longer. That's all I'm saying. Would you like to rephrase that? Not no, no, no. Please I rephrase that. He's, let him sleep in the bed he made. It was after this episode, Westies, that Lance got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I live with my foot in my mouth. But the point is, no. I love Australia. I love that voice. And I love that line. And she crushes it. And I generally lip sync it every time I'm in the car. And yeah, so then that, you know, came into the song way, way after we did our parts. And my part, and I remember, and I don't even think Eric, and he might have told us, I don't know, we have 3 million emails a day or just, texts a day. I think I so just sent it out to you at the end when they were there. Yeah. So it was, a, it was, so in some of the songs, like I think I mentioned in, in, uh, yesterday's, the keyboard stuff came in later at the very beginning. The stuff at the very beginning was put in later, and I didn't necessarily like it at first. But this, I really, really liked when I heard it. It's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's good. So it was a nice little surprise. Well, we were on a good run here. And then we found another guy in Fiverr who said that he could throw in some choral parts. And so I'm thinking, hey, you know, more voices. That's going to sound good. Did you say a and dude? It's a dude. He, he was like an arranger. All right. So, you know. So Lance I, we, automatically doesn't like we him. We paid a few dollars. Obviously. And he does some curl parts and he sends them back to me. What he fails to mention, and this is the overlay you're hearing right now, is he did the curl parts on his damn keyboard. 
and wow. used fake vo- voices oh, and put together like a just a terrible <laughs> melody line. And, <laughs> and, and then, you know, I sent it back. I mean, I paid him, to be honest, it was like 20 bucks. It's okay. So I didn't feel too ripped. But I told the guy, I'm like, thank you, but no, I can't use this. And much to my chagrin, he actually got really angry with me. And he was sending me dirty emails saying, how dare you not use this? I spent four days coming up with this part. And oh, as you've already wait, wait, heard, wait. you already this paid took him. you four days to do, this is not the business you should be in, my friend. Did you write that? Why is he mad after you paid him? I, Who cares I if I mean, at that point, not? just take the money and go away. You're going to have to so, send this to me. <laughs> again, that, that's buyer beware for five. <laughs> you, you don't always get what you think you're going to get. And so, you know, despite the failure of the choir, uh, the strings turned out so well uh, that the guys in the band, we've had this conversation numerous times, and Tommy brought up a little earlier, is one day we really want to have a symphonic version of this song. Uh, That would just be absolutely awesome. It's Tommy's dream, like my dream of a harpist. This is Tommy's dream. (laughs) And I might have actually put some feelers out. I know a bunch of people in the Salt Lake area that can do this. So uh, I've got a couple people lined up as soon as, uh, you know, after we get our vinyl pressing done, which I think is first on the budget list. But uh, it, I think it'll happen. It will. It should. I I'm. I want to hear it. I mean, just for just for me, I want to be able to say this yeah, is the symphonic it, version so. of our song because that's cool. We need a merch czar so we can build up that that little money <laughs> pile since <laughs> we, we don't have a go fund line. Yeah, we do. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and that was kind of it. I don't know, Bobby, do you have anything else to kind of add or hit on about the recording process? Not really. You guys pretty much hit everything. I jumped in when I felt like jumping in. I Nothing else really jumped out that I wanted to hit that wasn't already hit. I pulled up the session before we started recording tonight and... Uh, made a few notes along the way. Um, yeah, no, you guys hit everything, man. It was just, you know, 376 tracks is a lot. So it's, <laughs> it, it is. I mean, anytime you have a song with 416 tracks, uh, it's, it's going to be something else. Yeah. But you know, like, you know, 592 tracks wasn't so bad. We're, we're, I think we can beat that. I think we can beat it. 666. <laughs> no. There we are, the back to the devil the again. Beast. So, speaking of the devil, let's let's go to Tommy's. Tommy has been waiting for this conversation. I think for the entire season, we are going to tear about. apart the lyrics of Voyeuristic Symphony. Oh, are, are you ready, Tommy? I, I can see your excitement over Skype. He's wearing a red shirt. Well, yeah, my University of Utah. Shirt. Oh, you know I thought what? it was uh, Mister hey, Mistoffelees' uh, shirt. Let's let Tommy. Take it away. Why don't you start us off on this journey, Tommy, <laughs> since it's what you've been well, waiting for? Well, let me preface this by saying Eric and I had a discussion about the lyrics, and he actually told me what some of these meant. I would have never, ever guessed, and I'm not going to say it, so y'all, you're just going to figure it out yourselves. Um, but I actually was thinking that this was written about politicians in some way um and i'm looking at the lyrics here and i'm just trying to find the part that made me think that um it it was it was that or like hollywood celebrities that they're just so out of touch that was my initial thought when when i heard this song and um then I think after Eric and I spoke, I mean, obviously he opened up the the box of, you know, secrets into his head and kind of <laughs> explained more about it. But um, the one part that kind of jumped out at me was, um, I will hardly even notice that those outside are crying. We look the same with no sound. So I'm just like in my head, I'm, I'm kind of picturing somebody on a hill or on a high rise or something that's super well insulated. So they obviously, they can see the pain on the street, but they can't hear it. And so if you have kids or something, 
you hear you can hear things way before you can see them or even if you can't see them. So I think it's just easier to deal with that when you can't hear it. And so that was kind of my initial uh baby steps into this song was was you know like just people that are not in touch with the everyday pain and suffering that people who don't have as much are dealing with. That's good. I mean, I mean, and, and you're spot on. I, I hereby take back one shut up, Tommy, just for, <laughs> for how deep you went there and you nailed it, dude. Big time. Uh, it's, it's definitely this feel of, I, and not to be too cliche, but, but like the haves and the have nots. And, you know, it's, uh, I'll let Lance kind of talk about some stuff and I don't want to reveal too much yet. And we're going to get into it. There's not going to be any secrets left over when we're done with this podcast, which I don't normally do, but this one's a little too important to me, but definitely that theme is throughout the entire song. So bravo, Tommy grand slam. And, and there was actually a lyric change in this, the very last line in the second verse. Yep. Absolutely. In the new one on crescendo of silence, I say, so light a match, pull the string, take a shower, and let the future sort it out. Where on the demo, it's all the same in this town, which it never fit well with me. It sounded just too, meh, like I pulled it out of a book of sayings. Yeah, and that, that's the line that made me think of Hollywood types, you know, like, because you're in Southern California, so, and that's kind of, you know, L.A., Hollywood type, you know, they it's all the same. They don't care anyway. So that was the line. And then it got changed to something much better that fits a lot better. So yeah, thanks for uh, letting me chime in on the lyric change. Cause I feel, you know, special. And I know all those words too. I didn't need to look any of them. That's up, impressive. Which is unusual for one of your songs. I don't think I even know all the words yet, but you did really well. <laughs> hey, Lance. Hey, broski. Let's talk about lyrics. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't think for all the years I've played this song, I really sat down and thought about the perspective you just shared, Tommy. Uh, I think the chorus is what my question slash concern was many years ago. Because, you know, we're throwing out some, uh, some churchy words here. We've got a bunch of hallelujahs and glories and thanking Jesus that they're not like me. And and I don't know when Eric and I talked about this. It was years ago. And this was either what we talked about or it was something I made up and it's what I remember. So it may be way (laughs) offline, but... That'll make for a good podcast. Right. So it's similar to some of our other songs on this album where there's some disappointment with the church, which, again, I think it's important to know that Jesus loves the church, that the church has a place. But the problem is the church is built of humans, and humans are faulted and frail and hypocritical by nature because we're human and we've got problems. So if you really break down and you kind of pull your head up and see the big picture of this, thanking Jesus that people are not like me. There's just kind of that hypocrisy and that big headedness and that lack of love and I don't know, just love for other people um, and reaching out for the broken, kind of going back to Holy Ghosted. Thanking Jesus like other people are not like me is a very self-centered, kind of awful poisoned thing to say. So the lyrics might, you know, on the surface, like, oh, you know, you guys are a Christian band or whatever. And, and yeah, most of us, I think, Don't are Don't ever say believers. that again. Never, do, ever, do ever what? say that again. <laughs> say what? That you guys are a Christian band. That is... Right. But, like, I've heard people say that, right? Because you hear these words, but that's, that's the opposite of what this chorus is saying. This chorus, for me, is kind of calling out the hypocrisy of Much better, Lance. Those. Much better. Who are Christian. So, but that's what my point is, is where on the surface it can be confusing. But if you actually listen to the lyrics, holy hell, it's really calling people out, you know, to the curb and saying, look, we got to do this better. We've got to, we got to help people. We've got to really reach where people are. And, you know, we're, we're 
heavenly minded as opposed to we have no real use on earth if that's all we're thinking about. So the chorus for me is really the crux and it points to all of the lines you say in the verses, which are these silly things that humans often will feel or say or experience, unfortunately, where it's very selfish and it's not very loving. So that's kind of my perspective. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret. And I don't think I've said this out loud. You know, having grown up in the church and having that background, I absolutely am aware of the buzzwords and the catchphrases used in that sort of uh, insular, almost cliquish community. So I absolutely and purposely will use certain buzzwords to catch the ear of, of people in that walk of life. And, and Lance alluded to it, and well, actually he said it outright. And what we do in the chorus of Holy, uh, not Holy Ghost, sorry, what we do in the chorus of Voyeuristic Symphony is we turn that on its ear. So now I've caught your attention, but now, you know, in the nicest way possible, I kind of want to slap you across the face. And that's why we, we followed up with the phrase, you know, thank you, Jesus, that they are not like me. Now, Lance, many times throughout this podcast has accused me, you know, maliciously of stealing from scripture. <laughs> and I've had to correct him numerous times. And I'm shocked and maybe even a little bit offended, Lance, that you did not catch that I absolutely blatantly stole this from the Bible. Absolutely. You know, there is a parable that Jesus tells. And you know, to paraphrase, he says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other one a tax collector. The Pharisee, you know, for some context, the Pharisee are the religious rulers, the pastors, pastor man of the time. And the tax collector is the most reviled person, you know, that there is. And the Pharisee prays, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stands at a distance. He can't even look up to heaven. And he just says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And there's a juxtaposition there that we still see today in 2021, with our religious leaders on pedestals, you know, beating their chests, uh, pledging allegiance to political parties and lifting themselves up and saying, thank God I am not like them, those horrible people. And it's the exact opposite of, of what our heart condition should be like. Because, I mean, if you're anything like me, and sometimes I hope you're not, but but maybe you are, you know, you know, we're not all that. We're broken people, and we have no right to stand above anyone else and and push our own uh, exaltation, you know, above them. So, so Lance, you failed. I I absolutely stole this, which I figured you would catch, but th but that chorus is that Pharisee. You know, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory be. Thank you, Jesus, that they are not like me. Hallelujah, unless you see it differently. You know, so he's saying, if you see things differently than I do, then, you know, a pox upon you and your household, I want no part of that. Because it's that closed-mindedness that comes with a very legalistic uh, religious viewpoint. So, yeah, another nice, you know, happy, fun family tune that, that we're closing the album with here. <laughs> You know, not at all. This one's dark. There, there's a lot of darkness, which is why I love using those buzzwords. When you get that, you know, oh, they said hallelujah. They're a Christian band. It's like, yeah, maybe you should actually listen to what we're saying. Because while, you know, those of us in the band may subscribe to a faith that you can call Christian, you know, I prefer to say that I base my life off the teachings of Jesus because the word Christian has just been uh, adulterated in this day and age. Uh, we are definitely not a Christian band. The idea that a band can one have a, a theology to it or that the music can somehow pledge allegiance to Jesus and thus is Christian. That's ridiculous. 
chords are chords and notes are notes, and there's nothing Christian about music whatsoever. You know, the what Slayer plays is no different than what Amy Grant plays on the scale. It's the same damn notes. So I'm just to rant a little that the term Christian band just really rubs me the wrong way. Because what you mean to say is we're a band that pushes a Christian agenda upon you. That's what we see with Christian bands, your stripers of the world, you know, who are throwing Bibles at the heads of people in their audience and then, you know, cheating on their <laughs> wives and driving their Ferraris as they leave. You know, it's it's, it's disingenuous. They wore a cool spandex, though. <laughs> okay, the yellow and black spandex was cool. I'll, I'll give them that. <laughs> well, I may have missed the parable, Eric, but Shame. the song in general, I feel like I think of the the proverb of, you know, you, you see the speck in everyone else's eye, but you miss the log in your own. And I think that's the, the main sentiment that you're trying to hit upon on this tune. And that you would be exactly right. I mean, just, you know, in broad strokes, it's just that whole idea of placing yourself above anyone. Uh, right. Which, I mean, any sane person will tell you that that's a horrible way to live your life. Uh, what have we said? I, I don't remember the episode, but but we paraphrased, you know, the, the the wonderful Jesus Christ when he says, don't be a dick. You know, it's, uh, and I'll say it again. And now I have to put the, you know, the E next to this episode because I, I cursed again, but I stand by it. Just <laughs> don't be a dick. It's not hard. It's the easiest right. thing in the world. You know, and I'm not talking shut up, Tommy, because that's said with love. Everyone knows that. But we see so much dickishness in the world. I mean, if I go on face Facebook or Twitter or anything, every thread is just about people ripping each other apart, usually because of political views now, because that's the soup du jour going on. But it's ridiculous. The poison you're putting in your soul by doing this, and I'm guilty of it too. You know, I'll jump in and troll with the best of them, not under the West of House name, because that would be unprofessional. But, you know, it's, <laughs> ah, now I've, I've gone off the rails. He, he, Tommy's fallen asleep. Lance is, but, you know, he's whittling now. So, so let's jump back into the song. Bobby, save me. Say something oh smart. Gosh. No, I was enjoying the rant, man. That was fun. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You mentioned the uh, quote unquote, we're a Christian band, kind of not a Christian band sort of thing, because this was... So when I first heard Fallen, we've talked about this, was the the first song that that I got my hands and ears on. I was like, oh, these guys kind of sound like maybe there's some some Christian messages in there, but I don't I don't know. You know, it's just one song. And then yesterday's was its own thing. And then we came to Boyeristic Symphony. I, I remember because I don't listen to the song linearly when when I approach it to mix it. It's I, it's very jump around. I don't listen to the song in its entirety uh, until I'm probably about two thirds of the way through my process. And then I'm kind of checking to see if there's flow between all the sections. But I remember getting, I think I dove in on the the female voices first, actually, because I was curious what that was. And so the I ladies. pull in the session. Yeah, the ladies singing. And so I pull in the session. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of extra guest vocals. Well, I kind of know what I'm dealing with with the rest of the band. I've already done two songs with them. So I'll tackle the unfamiliar element first. And I pull it up and I see, okay, the waveform, it's in the back third of the song. Uh, so I jump to that part of the song and just listening to a voice in isolation go, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory be. I was like, oh, okay, these guys are a Christian band. Thank you, Jesus, that they are not like me. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> Hold on. Something else is going on here. And I mean, you guys already touched on most of it. I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse, but you you definitely nailed turning it on its head because you caught my attention there for a second and I was like, "Oh, this is th okay, they are just coming out and saying, "Oh, they're saying something else. They're saying something else." I like this. <laughs> I do not think it means what you think it means. Exactly. Exactly. My job here is done. <laughs> you nailed it. That was my that was my phrase when we when this song was released and and the, the CD was about to come out and like, okay, people, this song, it does not mean what you think it means. And I just kind of left it at that. You know, and I mean that's the way I do it too. You know, people are gonna hear what they're gonna hear it. And it is funny how some people will track with just a word. When you use the word Jesus in a song, 
the assumption that so many listeners give because they aren't diving in and parsing the lyrics is, is usually not the one that you're getting across because, you know, it's, we're not using it in a blaspheming way or, or being, you know, being rude or anything, but, but you say the word Jesus in the song and everyone goes, Oh, it's a gospel song. Well, no, listen to the rest of the damn lyrics. You know, there's, there's so much going on there, but it's, again, I, I like using those words on purpose and it's never to be, well, I, I'm not going to say it's never to be flippant because I've written plenty of flippant songs before, but I don't mess around with the name Jesus flippantly because there needs to be some respect that comes with that. I mean, just for myself. Amen. So, so kind of moving on, I want to kind of hit on, on verse two and Tommy brings up, you know, the, uh, Hardly even notice that those outside are crying. We look the same with no sound. Now, I I have a confession, Tommy. That line may or may not have been a little bit stolen. And and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I was uh, one of my favorite bands for, for many, many years is the band Queensryche. And yes, you can throw up the horns, Tommy, and I know Bobby's a fan too. And they had a song called Another Rainy Night which was off the empire album, oh, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah. One of the lines in that song is strange how laughter looks like crying with no sound. So I was oh, very yeah. much inspired by that line when I wrote this in voyeuristic symphony. So w- while I twisted it a little, I, I have to give, you know, props to Queensryche for writing such a Holy wonderful crap. lyric. I'm never going to hear this song the same again. <laughs> You've ruined it, Eric. I'm hearing the Queen's Rock song in my head right now. <laughs> uh, it's a little there. I, I mean, I, I do get, I've had some people say that some of our stuff where I sound like Jeff Tate, which I don't hear, but you know, it, it, that's not a term of disrespect at all. Jeff, there are worse people to well, be yeah, Jeff to. Tate was a fantastic singer. Was. God rest his voice. He's dead then, huh? To me. So oh, yes. let's let's kind of parse this oh, last part dead, of verse dead. two, which I think we've talked about. But one of the things in this song where people ask the most questions comes with the line, so light a match, pull the string, take oh. a shower. So I don't remember if I've actually talked about this line with you. I had a very long conversation with my wife after I wrote it. Uh, but if I haven't talked about it, if you already know, don't give it away. If I haven't talked about it, what do you think that means? Who's going first? I need to excuse myself. I need to excuse myself because I know. Oh, I, I don't know. We haven't talked about this. And the only, the, the imagery it conjures up in my head, because I'm very visual minded like that. Light a match, pull the string. It, it sounds like setting off a bomb like throwing a pipe bomb into a crowd. And this was all during the height uh, or at least right, right around the height of the George Floyd protests. And so that was at the forefront of a lot of our minds and, and then take a shower and just like you, in my head, the image is doing some incendiary things to other people, some harmful, dangerous, violent things. And then going home, taking a shower, like it's just the end of another day, like nothing really happened. That's the imagery that conjures up in my head. Wow, that's deep, Bobby. I, I know Jenny, my it's wife. It's the nitro talking. Right. My wife and I <laughs> talked about this, but I don't remember what the result of that conversation was. But Well, she's smarter than you, so she probably had some good insights. <laughs> I'm absolutely sure of that. Because all I think about is my normal morning routine where... I get on the throne and I. <laughs> He's wondering why he doesn't have a harpist waking him up. That's what he thinks about. Take a deuce and, you know, there's the match. <laughs> Got to light a match like in college. And, you know, then you maybe pull a string of a light and then you take a shower before I start my day. So remember but how I said, him oh, that's Can just a morning remember for how you. I said yeah. that, you know, whatever the lyrics mean to you, you know, they're right. I take it back. You need to you're, dilly, you're, dilly. You're absolutely. <laughs> you're, you could dilly, not be dilly. more wrong, and I <laughs> rebuke you publicly. Well, that's all I got. So I'm sure Jenny, who's probably asleep, has more to offer than I do. So that's all I got to offer. So why don't you have her come on the podcast from now on? You know, my favorite T-shirt my friend got, you all, you, well, you know him, Eric Spencer. I think it was his 30th birthday. 
the best birthday present t-shirt I've ever seen. I bring nothing to the table. That's what I am right now. I'm not going to argue with it. Oh, I'm here for <laughs> I'll, it. I'll so counter that with, with my favorite t-shirt that I ever got for Christmas. Was it said, I still have it. It says, there's absolutely no excuse for the way I'm about to behave. I love that. Yeah, my wife would agree <laughs> with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Ditto. so moving moving into this you know if you think about we have our theme of the haves and the have nots of the people in power and the people you know under their foot with their foot on their throats so what i do here this is a callback to uh horrible incidents and moments of atrocity throughout history so bobby was correct when he talks about this being about violence and it absolutely is uh but each phrase refers to a certain historical event. So light a match would be the Salem witch burnings. When you had the people in power uh, burning girls at the stake, you know, uh, who obviously were not witches. Thank you. Let's, let's get to modern society here. Uh, pull the string refers to lynchings. And take a shower refers to... Uh, the Jewish genocide at the concentration camps. So each event just, again, harkens back to a certain point in time where people in power, you know, lorded over those who had no choice but to be destroyed by others' bigotry. So did you remember that, Tommy? Were those right? Is that what we talked about? That That's right. And actually one of the uh, gentlemen I spoke with about uh, charting out the song for a symphony asked me about some of the lyrics cause he wasn't comfortable with them. And then when I explained it, he was like, Oh wow, that is super deep and super heavy. Well, good. I, I'm, I'm actually very happy that made someone uncomfortable. That should make you uncomfortable because these are very uncomfortable things to talk about, which is why he closed an album with them. And surrounded by beautiful cellos. The disturbed and disturbs the comforted. Yep. Amen, Bobby. So, uh, with no further ado, we have talked and ranted and fought and and God knows what Lance has done during this time. We but we've done it for you know the past hour or so. So let us now play Voyeuristic Symphony. Guest list is all full. 
You can laugh at all our stories and claim they're inside jokes like they did in days of old. And I will hardly even notice that those outside are crying. We look the same with no sound. the string, take a shower, and let the future sort it out, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory be, thank you Jesus, the thing So as I've said, I think nine times before, I still really like this song. Uh, one of my favorites on the album. It's just, it, it still speaks to me. And I, I think the message of it is, is worthwhile to listen to. One could say it's a perfect album closer. Yes, I, I would agree. A, a perfect album closer. I, I can't think of any other song on the album that that would have closed it out as well as Voyeuristic Symphony does. Yeah, out of those 10, it was a good bookend. Our, our work is cut out for us for album two and, and finding both openers and closers that work as well. But we're up for the task, Westies. It's absolutely. You know, I want to add to that. I was talking to my boss today at the end of the day, and he said, you know, I, I was listening to your album a lot this past week, which kind of made me shed a tear a little bit. And he's like, you know, every song in that whole thing just fit together. It was so well done song to song and the way they reacted to each other. That was really cool. And he likes music, but he's not a musician. Um, I just thought that was really cool to hear. I haven't heard anybody say that. They might like a song or two or whatever. But for him to say that, that the whole entirety of the album the way it started and finished, I thought that was pretty cool. It's uh, it, that is it's very cool to hear, and we've talked about in other episodes how that was kind of purposeful. And something about the songs on Crescendo of Silence just they don't all sound alike. At least they don't to me. You know, there's a lot of different things going on, but there is that journey from yesterday's to voyeuristic symphony, and 
you know you're on the same path through that journey. You know, it takes you. And there's a few left turns, but they're still, you know, a little recognizable. Uh, you know, they say you have your entire career to write your first album. Uh, but you only have a couple months to write your second. So we'll see if that lightning will strike twice. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little next episode. I mean, I mean, to be fair, we wrote Crescendo in like four months. We did not have our whole careers. Well, this song, this song was five years old. That's true. It'll be fun to do regardless, whatever happens. We'll see. We think you guys will like the new stuff. I like it. It's, it's pretty damn good. Uh, but what I'd like I to like, do now. I like what I, I've heard so far. Uh, we do have, you know, one episode remaining where it's kind of like a coda, you know, a real coda to the, to the season, not like the only bad Led Zeppelin album. God, there's a couple good uh, ones though, man. Don't no, be so it's harsh. ruined, dude. Coda is ruined. Uh, it, it's, it should, it should not exist. Out. Some good ones on there. But we want to thank you guys. Uh, we see the stats and we know people are downloading and listening to this podcast and to be honest, you know, it's not like you had a reason to. So you trusted us and you took a chance that this may be interesting. And it's a bunch of guys talking about the art that they created. And on the surface, that can be a very self-serving thing. And we try not to let it go into that, but we're just very thankful that you guys are resonating with those stories, you know, and and joining in, you know, by listening. And we really hope you're enjoying it. We had a great time making this album. It, it's going to be something that we look back on, you know, later in life. And, and I think I can speak for the guys in the band and, and also Bobby, that it, it's a, it's a point in time that we're going to be really proud of, you know, where just everything came together and, and crescendo of silence was born. And that was really cool. And for you guys to join us, we appreciate it so much. You know, we say many times that we made this for ourselves, which is true. But then once we've made it, it belongs to you. And that's just, it's one of the greatest honors as a musician and an artist to put something like that out in the world and, and have it embraced and enjoyed. So thank you, Westies, you know, for that. It's been a wonderful privilege to share that with you. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, as we said, penultimate episode. So next week, you know, we're going to talk about what's next, you know, as we move west. Uh, what's next for the band? Uh, kind of what we hope will happen, you know. Maybe we'll break up on the next episode. Who knows? Maybe we won't. I don't know. Maybe we'll say shut up, Tommy. Odds are 100% of that. Or fire him. But that will absolutely But we're going to kind of close up this season because not every episode can just be about, well, this song is about this and this song is about this. That was season one. Season two, we're going to go somewhere different and we'll talk about that next week. So make sure you tune in because uh, I think you're going to find it very enjoyable. So subscribe to the podcast so you get those nice little notifications that we've uploaded a new episode. If you want to hear our music, uh, that would be awesome. You can find us on Spotify or Apple Music or anywhere you stream your music. Doesn't matter the platform. Hey, we're on it. Just search up West of House. You can find us on Bandcamp at westofhouse.bandcamp.com. You can also listen to the album there. You can purchase a physical CD. There's a few of those left. Those are a limited edition. So if you still have a CD player, you might want to grab one of those uh, there. We don't have too many left, so... So give it an old buy. And we're also on the Facebooks and the Instagram and the Twitters, West of House Band, the usernames. And you can find us on YouTube where the podcasts are on YouTube and Tommy's got some snare drum videos and we've got our videos for the songs. And hey, it's a cool place to hang out. So subscribe there. So lots of places, you know, to get your, your West of House you know, magic. And don't forget to listen to the Pinecone EP. Uh, also everywhere you can stream music. That's a fun little five song ditty. And guys, any closing words before we say goodbye? Thank everybody for joining us. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you. And we hope to continue to bring you some good content that you guys will enjoy. I agree. It's humbling that people are actually into listening to us and playing our podcast. Um, I feel like if we just did this for our own benefit 
and nobody else heard it, we would be just as happy. But we are ecstatic that even one person is interested who isn't related to one of the band members. <laughs> so that <laughs> I think Eric's wife only has one CD and it's stuck in her CD player in her car. So she kind of has to listen this to it. This is true. I think Eric Eric might have broke the rest of the radio, so only the CD player works. That cannot be proven. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's been, uh, like he says, uh, a fun ride, and I can say that the next one is going to be more of a ride because it already is, but we're really looking forward to seeing uh, what's going to come out because we don't even really know. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. And Bobby Phillips, thanks for joining us again, man. I know it's 1.30 whoop, whoop. in the morning your time. And you yep. you stood up like a soldier and, w- and got through this with us. <laughs> I'm I'm happy. Nitro, it's that nitro, man. That'll that'll do you. No, I'm I'm grateful to be here, man. I'm 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 glad you guys let me uh, hop in for a couple episodes, and you guys kept me busy during uh, the early parts of COVID lockdown, and uh, made some new friends. And I'm excited to see where this relationship between the one, two, three, four, five of us goes, man. Love it. Looking forward to it. There are crazy times ahead, Westies, for you and us and everyone involved. So once again, thank you. And we will see you next week on the final episode of season one for Echoes Down the Road. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. It is finished. I really wanted to highlight really quick because I made a note of it. The solo out of the first chorus uh, is the most comfortably numb Pink Floyd thing I've heard him do. It, it And it fit that song perfectly. Okay, we're going to edit it. It's my solo, Bobby. You walked away while That's, we were talking about it. What? <laughs> That's my solo. Oh. That's okay, why yeah, I said we'll Kevin out. doubled it. Why is... Hey, no, 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 not that one. That's the that's the outro one. The, the one before the last chorus. I'm yeah, talking the mine. one after... Yeah, that's that's yeah. the one he doubled. I'm right. talking about the one oh. earlier in the song. Okay, no, that's his, yeah. Okay, you know what, go ahead, say what you were saying again. And point out where it was, just so I don't feel sad. <laughs> and take two. Take it as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, Bobby. Uh. <laughs> Kevin played this bitch. I was solo. just wait, looking wait, at the damn session. Look, I just ago. want some respect as a guitarist, man. <laughs>